So welcome everybody. Let's get let's get this party started. So oil and gas investing is super cool, highly profitable, highly tax advantage. Um next to real estate and sometimes it's better than real estate the tax savings opportunities here. So but I know a lot of you guys have questions or maybe don't know enough about this or have objections. So luckily we have some special guests here. We have Patra Francis and Mike who are raising capital and they help people find the right oil and gas deals, not con artists. Not they don't connect you with dry, they connect you with the right people who do this ethically and understand how this works. And they're gonna help you out with understanding what this investment means, the profitability, the functionality, and the whole process. So what I'm going to do is in just a little bit here, um, I'm going to let you guys take it away and I'm going to interrupt you when I want to riff on taxes because I love this stuff so much. And I'm going to let you guys lead the conversation. So uh, Patrick, can you introduce yourself in 60 seconds or less? 60 seconds, sure. So hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today and uh, for our workshop. And my name is Patra Francis. The way you pronounce it is like Cleopatra. And I am excited to be a co-host today along with Mark Perbert. And we have Mike right here too. And he's a head of Capital Development at Aspen Fund. And together today, we're going to we team up to bring you this workshop to talk about how oil and gas investment can offer significant tax saving. And also we can have like Q&A at the end. And I also a tax advisor, but I am a little bit different than other tax advisor because I am all about return of investment and I love money. But when I said about I love money because I love like in a nice way, I love freedom. So that's why I want, when I learn about something and I want to share it with everyone. And I'm uh, I'm planning to team up with Aspen. Um, and with that being said, I will turn it over to Mike, Mike to dive you, in. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah, you bet. Well, pleasure being with you guys. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Well, pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me on. So, uh, I'm with Aspen Funds. We're we're a firm based in Kansas City, and uh, we're, we're multidisciplinary. So we've got assets ranging from debt, credit funds, real estate equity investments, and then obviously oil and gas. So um, we've been operating for about 12 years. And in my role, I head up everything capital development. I uh, head up investor relations and uh, and work with all of our. We've got four partners here that. Uh, we all work together to bring in, bring in all the capital for, for the funds that we operate. So excited to partner with, with folks like Patra, who, who kind of bring a lot of value to, to her community and uh, excited to be here and, and share a little bit about this sector. All right, wonderful. In case, for those who don't know me, um, this is, my name is Mark Proberg. I'm a CPA and founder of Prosperal CPA. Uh, now, a lot of these people here are our clients as well. We have exclusive workshops for our clients. And we specialize in creating freedom in the lives of entrepreneurs through superior tax planning and services. Uh, you guys, uh, so also for some of our clients, I'm going to have some follow-up tax resources and work papers and video instructions to help you further evaluate the tax impacts of investing in oil and gas and additional considerations for you. And obviously, we can discuss this in our planning calls. Uh, so that's that's some of the fun stuff that we're going to be doing. Uh, Patra and Mike, let, I'll let you guys take it away. You can share your screen and let's get into it. Sounds good. I'm going to share my screen, make sure that everyone can see this okay. Can everyone see this okay? Yes. Awesome. Well, we're, we're going to, I'm going to roll through this and really leave a lot more time for Q&A, but just want to give some context for uh, for this sector, for folks, this is this is new for a lot of people, and you know, particularly on the tax side, uh, there's a lot of uh, shiny objects out there, and <laughs> and we'll we'll get into a little bit of that, but uh, but also just kind of I can speak more broadly to the sector and uh, the industry as a whole. So hopefully, leave a lot of time for Q and A for people. So uh, again, excited to to partner with you, Patra, on on some of the things that we're that we have going on. So. Yep. A disclaimer I as always. I want you to put your questions in the in the chat 
And I'll at the end, if we don't address it, we'll address every single question. I encourage you guys to put the questions in the chat. You can also, we'll, we'll remove the mute speaker if you want to talk and just have a conversation on these questions as well. So if you, if you can't talk or you're sneaking out of your office, put the question in the chat. Or, and, and also, if you want to go live, just let us know, and raise your hand, and we'll make you go live as well. All right. I'll continue, please. Yeah, of course. Well, standard kind of disclaimers here. This is not an offer for securities. This is, uh, uh, you know, certainly in any investment, you need to review private placement memorandums. Uh, you know, there's certainly limitations. Some of the information I'm, I'm sharing in here is, is truly just for informational purposes only. So, uh, and uh, yeah, kind of standard disclaimers here. Uh, so who's after? And I'll, I'll just kind of give you some context for who we are. We've been operating for, we're in our 12th year right now. And we, we've raised about $250 million in investor capital and uh, have about $600 million in assets under management. Uh, and, and kind of the number we're very excited about here is this $65 million in uh, distribution since inception. So uh, we like to send money back to our investors. But uh, I won't share a ton about us. This is more about you guys, more about uh, the sector in general. So really, I'm going to talk kind of high level here. And, and again, we'll get into some more detail, but but really a lot of uh, a lot of this is more conceptual. So kind of, I would say, rewinding to the very top would be why oil and gas for us. And what we're seeing uh, in, in the marketplace and in, uh, in the economy globally and here nationally is a kind of unique opportunity. So I wanted to talk about our process. What we really look at first and foremost always is macroeconomics. We want to be in investments where, you know, the tide is under our ship, if you will, and is is really, you know, even if even if something was mismanaged, if the tides are high, uh, it's really guiding the investments into uh, into success. And so, some of the lessons that we've learned through the over the past decade is is really timing is very critical, and so that's why we study macroeconomics first, and then as we identify those trends, then we identify. Uh, the best asset classes and strategies to take advantage of those trends. And then we assemble our teams uh, and create structures that uh, that that are friendly for our, for our retail investors. Uh, so tax benefits is, is a lot of what you guys are here for. and uh, and certainly this is a this is a tale that sometimes wags the dog in some sense. So uh, I'll kind of give you some overview here. I'm not going to spend a ton of time um, you know going, uh, we'll, we'll leave more time for Q&A on this, but generally there's in, in this space, there's three main tax benefits. So the two big ones are what you'll see here is intangible drilling costs and depletion. So uh, as always, uh, you should always consult with your CPA on all this. I'm not a CPA. I can't provide you tax advice. This is not tax advice uh, for me personally. So uh, of course, there's people in this room that can help you. So please, uh, you know, please be sure to do that in any investment that you make. Um, so intangible drilling costs, what are those? So these are really the expenses that are related to drilling. So in the oil and gas world, uh, the structure uh, of the industry in its basic terms is that you have a mineral rights owner. So this is someone who owns the right below the ground to drill. And so generally that mineral rights owner will lease those rights to an operator. And an operator is, Generally, these oil and gas companies who are doing the drilling, the day to day, uh, you know, setting up the rigs, getting all the pumps going, doing everything that's needed to go and, and drill these wells. So there's a lot of tax incentive for them, and really, intangible drilling costs is the big one that stands out to a lot of people because it's a very capital intensive industry. There's a lot of equipment, there's a lot of study, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the, the leases themselves uh, can be expensive to acquire. Um, you've got a lot of fuel costs, you've got repair supplies, a lot of overhead. So it's very, very uh, cost intensive, capital intensive to, to drill a new well. And so that's where these, these uh, incentives lie really is as a new well is being created, you can think of it as all that, all that capital is going in into the ground, literally throwing it down a hole in a sense. So uh, along with that comes operating losses and those operating losses, the unique benefit of intangible drilling costs when structured correctly in, in an investment can be used to offset ordinary income for, you know, even passive investors. So that's a, that's, that's a known fact. We can kind of, 
again, dig into a little bit more details, but that's what those intangible drilling costs are. They're the costs associated with the drilling. So it, it uh, has nothing to do with, with kind of the stabilized long-term ongoing drilling. It's the setup. And so um, generally in, in this space, you're going to see a lot of operators out there that are doing, that are doing these drilling uh, are that are drilling new wells and the big, you know, carrot, if you will, on the tax side is the big one is these intangible drilling costs. So along with that would be depletion. So depletion, you can think of it, you know, opposite for those of you who probably know real estate, depletion is kind of the opposite of appreciation. So in, you know, in real estate, you know, generally rents go up over time, right? In oil and gas, it's kind of the opposite where uh, all of the capital that we expend to go drill and extract all these minerals from the ground, those are consumed. So they're not, they don't renew, they're consumed and then they deplete over time. So those wells aren't going to be alive forever. We're not going to be able to drill them forever. And so there's uh, more of an accelerated uh, write-off, if you will, that that reduces the tax implication for uh, for those that are, that are uh, producing. So for our investments, for example, we get basically about a 15% haircut off the top uh, of the income. So if you had, you know, hundred thousand dollars in income to use a round number, you know, 85,000 is actually the reported income because that depletion is a credit to reduce that, uh, the tax implication, uh, for, for that income. So the, those two in tandem, the, the intangible drilling costs and depletion are the very big ones. Uh, there is depreciation that can pass through on equipment, things like that. Again, this is all with the right structures in place, but those are really the big ones that that pass through uh, to investors and and often what are very very exciting for for people to see. So uh, again, there'll be more questions. We can circle back to all of this, but uh, that's just kind of laying out what those are as as a baseline. So macro trends, kind of why oil and gas? So I talked about before what we really are looking for is looking ahead and seeing those trends, trying to see. You can't predict the waves, but you might be able to predict some of the tides. And that's what we're really looking for here at Aspen is to, to identify those. So some of the key things that we're seeing um, is, is really a reality check for the green initiative. And we're, we're seeing, you know, through the last decade, a huge push to you know, have a green revolution and get away completely from fossil fuels. And the reality check is we're, we're nowhere near the supply on the basic, the basic uh, materials needed to actually complete a transition there. So if you look at some of these copper, li copper, lithium, cobalt are, are a few of the, uh, you know, kind of key ingredients, if you will, for, for electric cars in particular. And what you're seeing is demand continuing to, uh, continues to increase, but supply being nowhere near that need. Um, and it's just going to take time. It's not that, it's not that it can't be done, but the reality check is we can't just step off the edge of the cliff, right? We need to have we need to have a plan in place, and 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 ultimately, there's really no other solution at this stage to be able to move mass and power uh, our entire grid outside of fossil fuels. So uh, we're, we're we're seeing that as a trend is that there's just nowhere near the supply and the mining efforts that would be uh, that are needed to, to actually bring that supply, take a long time. So lithium, for example, is about average of 16.5 years to actually develop those mines to, to deliver. So kind of key components when you really drill down into the numbers. Um, this is the, uh, from the Paris Agreement, the, the IEA, what are the goals that would be needed in order to complete this you know, revolution uh, into, into fully green, uh, green energy? So we need massive investment into natural resource development, resource security, and just time, lots and lots of time. So this is this is where we are, uh, kind of the stated policy uh, scenario is is from their Paris Agreement. What uh, what would that be needed? But long term, as they've looked at this, as we forecast out into 2040 and beyond, is how much would actually be needed to sustainably do this? And you'll see with all of these were far lagging um, behind what the you know what the plan is, and so there's just there's re there's really no way uh, at this stage to make that full transition. Kind of a, a, a tangent to that would be really the grid. You know, in some states, you know, we're we're seeing 
Uh, some cities in particular, we're seeing, you know, a lot of electric vehicles, for example, uh, can't even get powered because there's not enough uh, energy supply there. The grid can't handle the amount of electricity, the amount of load that's needed to charge all the vehicles. So there's just there's infrastructure that needs to take place. There's mining operations that need to take place. So all of that is just going to take time. Um, and in the interim, if you're reducing supply, uh, it's, it's, it's creating a unique kind of opportunity here. So um, long way from replacing carbon. So this is uh, as of 2020, these, these number, or I'm sorry, as of 2022 um, from uh, Zeon Geopolitics. I don't know if you guys uh, follow him at all, but uh, fantastic uh, overview here. But basically non-carbon makes up 17% of basically all fuels. So carbon would be considered coal, natural gas, and oil, make up 83% of all fuels that are used globally. So 17% is this sliver. You know, solar is basically a, a nothing of this uh, 17%, very, very small. Uh, nuclear, hydro, wind, solar, and then other renewables. So we're just far from being able to, you know, to phase out fossil fuels, nor should we. These are all pieces of the equation. So I think uh, there's a lot of political push behind this, which is, you know, for each to kind of choose. But but ultimately, if you look at it purely by the data, we're just nowhere near that transition. So what we're seeing kind of as a result is is a lot of supply in, in this push to go green has been reduction in supply for oil and gas and under investment in a very capital intensive industry. Uh, there's been massive under investment through the last decade. And what that over time is doing is constraining supply. So, you know, if you boil it down to simple terms, if demand stays steady, supply goes down, what happens? Prices go up. So what we are expecting over time is, is that prices will, will pretty significantly increase uh, globally as well as uh, here in the U.S. So we're, we're, we're kind of betting or betting on that happening. I, I would say we're betting on that. We're, we're preparing ourselves for, for that upside, but really kind of planning for, uh, for kind of a more moderate scenario. But, but knowing that there's at some point, if you continue to underinvest, under -invest, uh, energy prices can only go up. So that's, uh, these are some of the unique you know, things that we're seeing in this kind of uh, uh, in this supply standpoint coming down through basically next year. Um, collapse in private private equity funding. So one of the big kind of political pushes behind this is a lot of the large pension funds, uh, you know, very large private equity has really dominated the oil and gas and kind of the middle market space for a very long time. And ESG has come around to kind of score those investments and it's creating, you know, disincentive, if you will, to continue to fund oil and gas operations. And as a result, what we're seeing is this massive funding gap again in a very capital intensive so we're seeing unique opportunities for for those in private capital and individual investors to partner with you know other firms that are working in the middle market to to come in because there's just not as much competition so if there's less competition and uh you know a lot of a lot of drilling opportunities uh the 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 private capital is really the solution there's really not a whole lot of other solutions uh, out there because the larger the larger these firms have become, the more uh, disincentive there is for them from from a scoring standpoint. Uh, oil and gas trends. This is more on the demand side. We're so we're we're expecting oil and gas to actually continue to increase through 2030, uh, if not, they pretty close to where we are today. So very, uh, you know, very steady in terms of demand. Um, so again, same thing. If demand stays steady. Right. If supply comes down, what happens? Prices go up. So pricing forecasts are, you know, from some of the larger institutions out there, larger banks out there is that, you know, prices are going to be pretty, uh, you know, pretty high over the next several years. Uh, so this would be, you know, price per barrel, basically uh, for oil. We'll just use oil as, a, as, a, as an example here. There's other minerals, but um, our, our like kind of how we structure all of our investments is to have a sixty-seven dollar kind of baseline average through through a ten-year life, but really position ourselves for this upside of what we think will happen, knowing that we'll still be profitable at this kind of moderate and underwrite more to the downside. 
knowing that we'll kind of set ourselves up for this potential upside. That's that's definitely where we see things going. And, and again, this is powering a lot of the why we would go after oil and gas. So uh, important for everybody to understand key risks in uh, really any investment, but oil and gas in particular, this is a commodity. So uh, there, there's several things. So one, you have operator risks, like who is it that is actually doing the drilling operations? Uh, the other would be the actual drilling risks is things don't always go to plan, right? And Liabilities can be incurred. You know, litigations can happen when you know drilling doesn't go right. Uh, they make mistakes, things like that. Uh, there's certainly environmental risks if you know water supplies can be contaminated. And this is a lot of stuff you hear kind of in the narrative, uh, but these are all risks. And then ultimately, commodity prices uh, are a global calculus. So there's really no way to control what does oil trade at today, what does natural gas trade at today. Those are all. Uh, pricing risks that cannot be controlled. So those are important things for everyone to understand that this is a very opportunistic investment and there are there are absolutely are risks that need to be understood and accounted for. Uh, of course, there are benefits and of course, there's exciting things that uh, people can hit in terms of return, but that's very, very important to always highlight uh, the risks that are associated. Uh, for us, kind of our st our strategy, you know, from our, our this is our most recent uh, our most recent fund that we closed out last year uh, is we partner with major operators. So these are companies predominantly that are publicly traded and you know multi billion dollar cap type companies who uh, are are very sophisticated, well capitalized, and uh, have a have a proven track record on the operations side. So. This is a great way for us to kind of offset a lot of those kind of operating and drilling risks, you know, even environmental risks, uh, when you've got large publicly traded companies that you're partnering with alongside. So uh, I'm not, too, not I'm not talking too much more about our structure. This is more kind of informational purposes only, but uh, this is just to kind of demonstrate some of the you know, some of the key things for you guys to look at when you're when you're assessing oil and gas investments. So uh, Patra will will kind of dig into some of this uh, along the way. She's uh, definitely going to have some, uh, you know, some investment op opportunities for you. So Patra, you can kind of speak to this. But uh, the most of the time, again, I, this is a quick summary, but I really wanted to highlight, uh, you know, some of the structural things and then leave lots of time for, for Q&A. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to you guys. Thank you so much, Mike, for the presentation. Those are great information. and. Um, I think that we can open, I mean, if anyone interested, there is a QR code that uh, we maybe we can pop up again for the QR code. You can, you know, scan the QR code and set up a meeting with me or um, put a soft commit and we will reach out to you. But however, I want to use this opportunity since Mike is here for us to ask him anything about, you know, um, what are, you know, the risks that, um, when you get into in any investment, right, there's always a risk involved, but the potential reward in oil and gas is going to be significant. The ROI is around like three to four percent, like four, uh, three to four times, not percent, <laughs> three to four times uh, multiple. So, and um, but when even though there is a risk involved, but however, if you put money into your checking or saving at cow, you already know that you are you can see that your risk is there because there is um you know like the cost of like inflation and all of that. That means your money is gonna reduce in value. So this is gonna be a great opportunity. And most of the time when the many people invest into real estate and most of the time when the real estate is struggling, oil and gas tend to, you know, doing well. And when the oil and gas is not doing well, real estate tend to do well, right? So what I want you to take a look at is on the diversify your portfolio. And this would be a great asset class for you to take a look into. So even we can, I think there are some people asking questions here. And maybe Mike, um, you can touch base on that, or Mark, if you have anything to to say on this. Yeah. So um, talk about diversification. Not only that, but uh, um, the thing I like about oil and gas is when it's profitable, it's treated as passive income. So if you guys don't have real estate professional tax status, and there's a year that you're not investing to the oil and gas to keep on, eventually the profits are going to accumulate year after year, and you're going to have a positive income statement. Well. If you have real estate, you can use your depreciation and maximize your depreciation with cost segregation studies. 
to offset the cash flow from oil and gas. So, and then it's also, you're not paying FICA taxes. So even when it's profitable, now most of our clients invest year after year and create losses on their tax returns and it reduces their, their, their taxable income. But let's say you don't reinvest to get that year one intangible drilling cost deduction. You're likely still going to see benefits. Well, first off, you get a lot, you're getting more cash flow, but also it's taxed at it's tax advantage advantage with your depletion deduction. And you can use real estate losses, even without rep status or short-term rental loopholes, the losses from the real estate, because they're also passive, will offset your profits in oil and gas. So when you're not only do you diversify, but it, for some of you guys with real estate who, who aren't using the losses, this is your first chance to actually activate these losses and pay no taxes on the cash flow from your oil and gas or less taxes, depending on your situation. Yeah. And usually, Mike, is that true that most of the time already a depletion allowance is about 15%. So let's say that you get a distribution of um, random number 10,000, you only pay 8,500 versus a uh, 10,000 of your distribution. So that's not just a tax benefit upfront on the intangible dealing cost. You can also get the benefit from the depletion allowance as well. Yeah, that would come every year uh, on, on those investments. So it creates a ton of, not only can you have write-offs from the things we've been talking about, but you're also creating a lot of tax efficiency along the way for uh, particular ones that are already producing. So where you're getting lots of income uh, that is, that income is is on paper being reduced pretty dramatically. Okay. I got a question I'm going to read out, and I'm not going to answer because I don't know what, is, what this is. Uh, what does STEPS and SDS stand for? Uh, so these are like scenarios. So this is the the EIA is uh, kind of a global energy ad advisory, basically, um, and they have published a bunch of scenarios, basically, you know, forward looking scenarios. So how much energy are we going to need? So it's, uh, it's a model basically. So that's, that's what those, those scenarios are predicting in terms of what, what are the demand and supply needs for, for particular, uh, you know, all different types of energy, right? So not just fossil fuels. So I can, uh, let me find a, I can, I think yeah, I can reply on this one. Yeah, I'll throw the link in there. That'll that'll kind of tie you into those. But these are kind of the global authorities on, uh, you know, how much how much supply, how much demand are going to be needed to to meet, you know, some of the objectives basically. Mm -hmm. Question for you, Patrick. I think you can. I'm going to give this one to you, Patrick. Can investors choose when to take distributions? For example, leave funds invested until. Um, until in a good position to offset taxes? Um, you should, usually we pay on the potential monthly distribution and each monthly distribution at the end of the year, you have to, uh, you're gonna get the form K1 from the, the fund that you are investing in and um, the amount, it's gonna be less than what you, um, I mean, the uh, on, you're going to receive a K-1 when you file tax, you're going to pay 15% less than what you actually receive. Right. So that, the, the amount that's taxable is less than the amount you receive, which is awesome. That's better than your yes. W-2 job because in your W-2 job, you're paying taxes on all that that hits your account. Yeah. And I think one thing to touch base on that too, with oil and gas, you can offset W-2 passive, active income, and you don't have, I think, Mark, say that already but i just want to add something more you can you don't need to meet like a hundred hours uh participation material participation on this so it can upset any type of income and you don't need to be a real estate professional either because many times what came across is when you invest into real estate and you have like you are earn income either you are a doctor you are because i have many doctors and like many doctors, many business owners who is our, our clients and they cannot use, even though they own real estate, they, they have a, a passive loss, but they cannot offset their own income. With oil and gas, you can offset those uh, income. It doesn't really matter what type of income you receive. Um, I have a question for Mike. If you can touch base on, you know, 
like for me at the beginning, I I haven't learned ab- about it already. But if you can touch base on how does it work on like on the operating when you go drill like the the process of um when you find oil and gas, right? Like maybe you can start it from exploration, drilling, uh, and yeah. like for people to understand more. Yeah. So. I mean, I think I know where your question is going. So there's, I mean, there's different strategies, right? Oil and gas, there's not just one, like in any investment, generally, there's not just a one size fits all. So most of the tax benefits and things that we're talking about are are correlated to drilling. And so often what you'll see in this sector is a lot of like, hey, I'm going to get a 80, 90% write off year one. Typically, that's an indication that that is a drilling strategy. So drilling strategy has a you know, major tax strategy built into it, right? That's a big part of uh, a, a way to reduce the risk because it's a very risky investment. We don't, it's below the ground. We can't see it. We can study the geology. We can uh, go deep. So it, uh, that, that, that's one piece of the puzzle, right? So th- that would be more drilling. What often there's, there can be called wildcatting. There's also infill drilling. So where you already have an established fill, and then we're going to go and fill more drills in this established area. So there's there's lots of nuance there. Um, there's other strategies where you also can invest in what's called mineral rights. The mineral rights are, you know, I, I own the rights below the ground. I don't participate in the drilling. I get a royalty. I get paid, you know, for that lease. Uh, and I get paid first, but I don't get the tax benefits that come from that. So all the tax benefits are tied to what's called working interest. So working interest is the operation, the operator who's doing the drilling. So that lease, the the lease that uh, they have can also get split up. Like the interest in that lease is like, you know, like many other assets, it could be, you know, the ownership of that and the flow of money and tax benefits can get broken up in lots of different ways. So um, some of the other strategies that are prevalent is also buying into what's called existing uh, wells or PDP, so proven, developed, and producing wells. So this is, you know, if you know, for 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 the things that we do, we we generally go more towards PDP, where you're buying into existing production. So that strategy comes more with depletion because we already have existing oil and gas that's being produced. And so the tax benefit that comes from that is depletion and then the path through depreciation of equipment. Um, the only time we would capture IDCs and tangible drilling costs is if we're doing more drilling. So kind of our strategy has always been to buy into existing production where there's proven, developed and producing wells. We'll buy into that at some calculus, which is generally uh, a pretty sizable cap rate. So there's a lot of cash flow. And then we on top of that would contribute additional capital to develop more wells. So what that creates is more intangible drilling costs that we can offset the income that we're receiving, this large amount of income we're receiving from the proven wells. The new wells, the drilling of those new wells can be uh, used to offset that in a, in a big way. And then also compound the cash flow. So once those new wells start to produce, the cash flow starts to grow. So that's our particular strategy, but uh, on the tax side, really, the the key thing for everyone to understand is: are you are you in the working interest, or are you not? And the tax benefits are always tied to the working interest, and so you're having to take on you know some of that that risk. Um, the the other key thing for people to kind of understand is also um, the position and the risk that they're taking. Um, so if you're going to participate in uh, these offsets to your W two income. You're going to have to be a part. Of the The structure of the of the investment is generally a general partnership. So that partnership, you get to opt in to become a general partner or a limited partner. And what that ultimately means is the liabilities are either not limited or they're limited. So there's some risks that are associated with being a part of the general partnership. So that's why you need to have a pretty known understanding of the tax scenario because. Uh, you are taking on that risk, so that you need to be compensated for it in a sense. And so the tax benefits are are a big piece of that. Uh, and so why somebody would go just do something that's exploratory that we don't know if it's going to make money, but we do know it's going to get a big tax benefit. And in order for me to 
capture that tax benefit, it has to be structured as a limited partnership, and I'd need to be a part of the general partnership. And so part of that risk is also if something were to happen, say the fund and or investment incurred a liability that exceeded the assets of the fund, then your uh, exposure could be beyond your initial principal that you invested. So it's just important for people to understand that versus, you know, a lot of a lot of these other passive investments are, uh, you know, limited, meaning you'd be limited to the principal that you invested. So um, th- does that kind of answer where I think you were going with that question? Yes, Mike. Thank you. And I think that just to clarify about the term terminology about intangible dealing costs and tangible dealing costs and depletion allowance, we want to, uh, because if, uh, many of you, if you just new in this uh, industry, you may be wonder what does it mean intangible dealing costs, right? Intangible dealing costs is the cost of, uh, you know, the labor costs, the services, and you can correct me too, Mike, if I'm wrong. Um, it's uh, the cost that you, it goes toward the cost of labor into the drilling. And intangible uh, tangible dealing costs is the cost that goes toward the equipment that drilling to the ground. And for the depletion allowances, it's uh, go toward like those expenses that include into the exploration, into like to do some research on the land that where, um, you know, it's kind of like capital ep- expenditure. So that's um, those are the three key things that when it comes to tax benefit, those are the expenses that um, it goes into oil and gas uh, investment. There was another right? good question in here. Yeah, there was another good question here. I think I saw Daniel. Yeah. Hey, Daniel. Um, you said I have a question about what the tax benefit looks like in years two plus. Did you get nearly all the tax benefit year one? Uh, do you have strategies for reducing in years two? Uh, yeah, so great. It depends on the investment, right? Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not currently promoting any specific deal right now. So, um, so I'll kind of speak more generally. It, it really depends on the investment. So, if if it's a limited raise, meaning it's kind of a closed-ended investment where we raised X amount of money to go do X drilling, right? Generally, those you're capturing all that the the main benefit, the main tax benefit in in year one. Assuming that you're, you know, doing your drilling in year one, so it, it really is correlated to the timing in which that drilling is happening. So, you know, for for instance, our strategy, you know, broadly is that we'll have ongoing development. So every year we'll develop X amount of wells. Uh, depletion is going to happen every year, so that's something that is always going to be there as a tax efficiency. It's not that they're going to create a write-off, but it will reduce the income. So really, the the write off would be correlated to how much development you had done in a given year. So in our particular strategy, again, we've got a lot of income that's being produced. Um, we do a lot of a new drilling, which is offsetting that income. And in a given year, depending on the volume of that new development, will really dictate how much of a write off or not that there is. I mean, if income is really really high and new development is low, then generally there's not going to be a write-off. There's going to be depletion to reduce the tax uh, the tax implication, but there's not going to be a write-off in that particular strategy versus, you know, other, you know, other funds are more development focused. Other investments might be more development focused. So they might just be continually recirculating cash into doing more development to create more write-offs through the year. So it, it really is correlated to the amount of development that's happening. Yeah. We have a tax question I'm going to take. Um, is a distribution treated as passive income or active income? Is a portion of it treated as return of capital? Actually, that last part I'll let you guys take. But um, what's really unique about oil and gas is when you the money comes in, it's passive, which is good. It's, that's what you want to see. So unlike your W-2, you don't have any self-employment taxes. You don't have any workers' comp tax and all that other stuff that hits you in the head. It's just passive and it's taxed at your marginal rates. And then it's obviously offset by depletion. Depletion. Um, when it's a, operating at a loss, likely in year one, it's non-passive. And non-passive losses are the, the most desirable form of losses because they'll offset any type of income. And then a little more, and 
there's some other strategies here. Again, re- you combine real estate with oil and gas, you create more losses with cost segregation in the real estate to offset the profits in oil and gas. If there's profits in oil and gas and you're not reinvesting to create losses, and then there's a whole other world of things that we can do here. And when your income is passive and positive, you have more flexibility and opportunities to create losses. It's just easier to create losses to offset your passive income than non-passive, especially with real estate. You can invest in more real estate, invest passively in real estate, real estate syndications, mobile home parks. There's just so many ways to create losses. And if it's really, really high and significant, you can even buy tax credits. And there's all sorts of interesting stuff out there when you're strategic with your tax advisor. You want me to tackle the the kind of back half of this question? Yeah, the part about return of investment capital. I have, you know, we've seen, a lot of our clients are investing, but I, I I see the K ones. What what's what are you guys seeing as a portion of this is treated just as a return of capital as opposed to a, a dis- distribution of income? Yeah, uh, again, I I can't speak to other people's structures exactly. Um, you know, typically how we would structure it is. Um, you know, in, in return of capital is typically where there was a sale of an asset versus the actual income. So we have kind of a profit allocation, which would be, you know, distribution or uh, uh, a dividend, whatever, you know, however that gets categorized. But, but generally, that's going to be uh, an allocation from the profit. And so that's based on the amount of income that's being generated from the operation of that well. And then if there's return of capital, that's generally when we've sold off an asset. Let's say we went and built the well and it started producing and a portion of the income was distributed. And then we, you know, we ended up selling that asset quickly and realizing, you know, realizing, you know, profit, um, a portion of that would be more allocated towards the return of actual capital. So it's usually tied to, uh, for those that are doing a lot of gap compliant stuff are are seeing that return of capital happen when a sale of an asset happens. Cool. Let's see what other questions we have here. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions here. Um, I was going to, I I do have some other things to consider on the tax side. Um, unless we have any other questions, I'm going to share with you. I'd like to share with you some other thoughts here on the tax side. So, so there's some, so when you really dive deep into oil and gas, um, there are some other more advanced things you can do here. So we have a lot of, we started off specializing in real estate and it still is our niche. So if you are looking to pivot out of real estate, or let's say you just can't find a good deal, or let's say you just want to get rid of this property is too high maintenance. You can 1031 into oil and gas. So you go from potentially paying capital gains tax to actually rolling your funds into oil and gas and going to an investment that's truly passive and gives you tax benefits. Um, for some of you doing capital gains planning, you're going to have capital gains on your stocks. You can't use oil and gas working interest to directly offset cap gains, but it'll still offset your taxable income from your W-2s or your ordinary income. And you're going to get back your principal from the stock as well. So you may find you have a capital gain event you get back your principal and your and your profits from your stocks. You can put it to capital gains, and the net effect is actually going to be a reduction in your taxes potentially here, which is really cool. And then there are qualified opportunity zone funds investing in oil and gas that are really really exciting, and it really just plays on the intangible drilling costs, offsetting all of the profits, and you you're getting untaxed distributions and a really the idea here is to have an untaxed, massive capital gain after you've held it for 10 years. And then you can even invest in oil and gas to, in your retirement accounts to offset a Roth conversion and offset 50% of the taxes and move it into a Roth IRA where it can grow and profit tax-free in a Roth. So there's lots of versatility and creativity when you really dive deep into all these exciting oil and gas tax strategies. Yeah, and one of the the thing that I would um, the way that I do my due diligence when I invest into oil and gas, 
also instead of investing into just one well, I would like to invest into multiple well in one fund. So that's also going to reduce your risk and um and helps um you know like because when we're talking about investment everything that's like we mentioned before that is everything is about risk but how can we manage our risk to make it uh better right so with that and then you also want to take a look at what type of that track like that track record of the operator who you are working with um like with aspen the the reason why i like um, want to, to partner with them that's because of they have a big team and that communication is very great um, and they have they've been doing uh, in this deal quite some times already so that's uh, one of the things that when I take a look into investment I want to work with reputable um, company or operator but I have a question for you guys um, Patra or Mike so you have your royalty rights interests, right? Where you don't get the intangible, tangible drilling cost deductions. What's the opportunity here? Why would someone decide to do this if they can't reduce their taxes? Is the profitability enough to justify going that route? Yeah, it's really passivity. Um, you know, generally where, where those work excellent is that they, they found oil in the ground, right? And I, without having to do anything, I get a I get a royalty on everything pulled out of the ground, like clockwork. So it's really it's not a tax play; it's it's a passive income play. Uh, but it only really works if there's oil in the ground. So if there's or gas or whatever the mineral is, um, if there's no production, then there's no royalty. So that's that's kind of the trade off. So that's much it's a much lower price of acquisition. Um, and much less risk. There's no operating risk. You don't share in any, any of the drilling risks. You don't share in any of the um, commodity price risk. It's truly just, hey, I, I happen to own this. And it, it'd almost be like, you know, owning land and uh, and having kind of a, a, a gross lease or a uh, enterprise lease with a, a farmer, you know, so it's based on the amount of production, but I don't have to do anything and I share no liability. So, it's just a more passive, lower risk way to, you know, get exposure. And then if there is a lot of production, then you can make a lot of money doing it uh, as long as you have a great operator there. So the other piece of it is if it's not a great operator, you know, you do have rights as a, as a member rights owner. So you could, you know, say, you know, company A comes in and they're, they're really not doing a great job and there's proven reserves in the ground and they're just not doing and they're not hitting, they're not hitting a certain minimum. I can actually force them out and bring in a new operator. So you, you have some rights to, you know, protect your, uh, you know, protect the downside in a, in a situation where, you know, there, there's proven reserves without, uh, without results. So it's just a different strategy. There's really, again, not, it's not a tax play at all. I have a, I have a question for Patra. Patra, if, if people are interested in doing this stuff, but they don't know where to get started or who to trust or how much money to put in or, or, you know, they, they're just totally lost right now. What, what does someone do to get started in this? They can set up a meeting with me. We can set up a like 15 minutes meeting and to see that how I can help you. Um, and there is a QR code that I can, can pop up real quick. Give me one second. Uh, let me grab uh, the QR code. You can set up a, a meeting with us. And what's that process look like if when they decide to move forward? You know, do they just do they you know give you a, a a bucket of cash? Do they wire you? Do they what is there? What does that look like? So first of all, currently we are uh, still working on the opportunity uh, for the end of this year. I know that we we are going to we are excited to have an opportunity coming in January. And what we, the process, the next step is there is a QR code for you to do a soft commit. Once you uh, fill out the fillable form, we will reach out to you and then we will send you the um, information. Yeah, is that the you, one, Patra? Is that the right one? That's actually for the soft commit uh, form. You can also fill out that form and I will 
personally reach out to you or I have my assistant reach out to you to set, schedule a time. Um, and we will have like the portal to, I think Mike, you probably answer this one better on the process of um, either on the process of after the sub commit, we have the PPM for them to sign an operating agreement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just like any investment, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll find, you'll fill out a subscription agreement. Patra will work with you on all those things. So, uh, you know, with our next coming fund, if, uh, you know, if that's a good fit for you, then reach out to Patra. She'll have a PPM for you to, uh, to review. Uh, you'll execute that. And then once you've, you've, uh, basically, once you've done that and made sure that you've submitted your accreditation verification with her, then uh, funding instructions come from there and you're off to the races. Yeah. Okay. And my, I think I, we got a great question here. So, Sid, we only have five minutes. A pro forma for sample project would be helpful. Do you have your last project that we can show to our audience? Um, sure. Like maybe sure. We're talking about the return and. Absolutely. Yeah. Happy to. Um, I didn't want to uh, impose too much, but I'm always happy to talk about what we're doing. So um, um, let me pull up uh, a little deck here. While you, are, while you are pulling up the information, what I want to talk about also is this uh, oil and gas is only currently only open to accredited investor. And what is accredited investor? Those... <laughs> I create that investor is pe for people who make over than 200,000 as an individual or 300,000 married jointly, or you have an asset over than 1 million. So um, this one is open to accredited investor only mm -hmm. currently. But if you are unsure about mm -hmm. your accredited status, you can reach out to me. I can help you with that as well. All right, I'm, I've almost got this pulled up here for some reason. It's... Come on. Well, another thing I just want to, another little tax nugget here that I think is really cool here is you can use, if you have a sole proprietor, um, you can, and that is subject to FICA tax. I'm not sure if I said this, but you can offset your FICA taxes as well with oil and gas. In that case, you want to make sure you invest in the name of the the, the husband or wife um, who is actually incurring self-employment tax, and then it'll net against that. And that's an extra 15.3% tax savings, potentially. Really cool yes. stuff there. Oh, that's awesome. Because of, there are many times that Many clients that they cannot uh, elect to be an S corp in the current year, so they can use oil and gas to offset those uh, income. And sometimes right. physicians aren't even allowed to; they get like ten ninety nine and come, they can't even use an LLC uh, or an S corp. So, so, just an extra little bonus there. Oh yeah, that's wonderful. All right, I'm going to share my screen here Hi. with you. All right, can you guys see this? Okay. <sighs> yes. Um, yeah, they're in the process. They should be out soon. All right. So uh, this is from our last fund. This is called the 116 Upstream Energy Fund 6. <laughs> so, super, super long name. The next fund we have coming out is the same name, Upstream Energy okay. Fund Okay. How are you doing? Sorry for the wait. Um, I can, um, I'm trying to see who's wait. talking. Oh. I, can I think it's oh, okay. Lee. Lee. Okay, Lee. so this... Yeah, I think uh, Lightly. Lightly? Yeah. All right, here we go. We're good. Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, so the next fund is is the Upstream Energy Fund 7. It's the same strategy. Um, you know, we can get into a bunch of details here, but just if you're looking for, you know, pure pro forma base, this is, this is what we're looking at. So how we've structured this type of investment is that we've got 100% of the cash flow in the first year is reinvested into drilling. So that allows us to, you know, capture as much tax benefit as possible in the first year. So though there will be cash flow, we're not going to distribute that. Uh, we're we're going to put that to work. Um, this is per, like this particular portfolio, we have interest in over 250 wells uh, where we're part of the working interest. It's called non-operating working interest, meaning we're not the operator. Um, 
So we buy into that existing production where there's a lot of income. And again, we do additional development on top of that to compound the cash flow. So this you'll see cash on cash because then we're ramping up over time to where we, we hit some pretty staggering numbers. And then we'll kind of behind the scenes, what we're doing strategically is we're rolling up a portfolio. So we're buying assets in the middle market at you know, 10, 20, 30 million dollars each, rolling those into a portfolio, and then we'll look to sell those. Um, along the way, we'll develop more wells that are very valuable. You know, new young wells that are producing are very, very valuable. So we're we're increasing the overall volume uh, and well count, and then and then selling that off when prices are high. That's generally when you have a lot of buyers. So um, from a you know basic metric, what this is looking at, uh, this is a ten year hold. This portfolio is targeting a thirty one percent IRR over those ten years, which translates to an eight point four five at x equity multiple. So you throw a hundred grand in over those ten years, you come out between the cash flow and the equity realization is $845,000. So this is very high yield, very high total return. Uh, the average cash on cash would be 26%. Wow. Uh, so very, very high cash flow, very, very high uh, total return. And again, all these kind of tax benefits along the way. So our particular strategy is more about total return and income with uh, tax efficiency and tax benefits along the way, because we're buying into existing production, there's a lot of income. So in order to offset all of that, we'd have to have a lot of development. So this is, this is uh, that our particular strategy. There's other strategies out there that are more development heavy, um, where there's not existing income to offset. Uh, and that's where you get the bigger, you know, bigger write-off in year one is, is typically those, but we'll still have all of We'll still have all those things, but they'll be offset by the amount of income that we're producing. So this will just give you a snapshot of the type of thing. So this is based on oil at $67.32 over 10 years. So this is kind of what we call a moderate forecast. Uh, we've, we've modeled a downside, which is kind of the next slide. I, I'll, I won't bore you guys with that, but we kind of model the downside. We model the moderate while positioning ourselves, kind of like I talked about earlier for the upside. Of what we actually think will happen is price is likely to go up. And so these numbers get even a little bit better. <laughs> well, potentially a lot of it better. So who knows if that will happen for sure, but but we feel confident that if we if we're wrong about oil and oil and gas, we're gonna make 31%. If we're if we're right, then the numbers could be a little silly. That's great. And I can tell that the 67 point 32, that's pretty like con on the conservative side, right? Yeah, that's the Bank of Oklahoma's, uh, they, it's called Bank of Oklahoma Strip. And so they have a 10-year a, a pricing forecast. That's exactly what we use to, to model this. Yeah, because normally, um, I mean, if the, the more oil you can produce and the higher of the, uh, the price of gas, that's how you can get the higher return. So 100%. by yeah by using sixty seven thirty two that's already on the conservative side, which is that's right. That's good. So I know we're at time. I don't want to take anybody else's time. I appreciate the appreciate you guys having me on, and um, let me know if I can be a resource. Yes, thank you so much, Mike. You're welcome, Mark. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Uh, one more thing for our current clients, I'm going to do give you some additional resources in the school library on how to look at this and, and evaluate the tax component of this. And also when you look at a prospectus, how does that impact you personally on your 1040 when the money comes in and you create the tax deductions? Um, and also uh, Patra's contact information, if you want to explore, look at the private placement memorandums and see what's available or connect and do a free consult where you learn more. Uh, all that information will be in our school library. And also you guys will get, uh, any, uh, obviously you, Patra has your information and she'll send you everything you need as well. Yeah, I will send slides to everyone and also um, a link to book a time. Yes, all right. I all think right. that's Thanks it. Thanks everybody <laughs> for showing up. Yeah, thank you. We'll keep in touch. Have a wonderful rest of your day.